Hello, everyone, and welcome to the podcast. As always, we are welcomed and honored to have the venerable, honorable Mr. S.G. Anand, uh, cogent as he is, truther extraordinaire, to join us for our once a month get together podcast to talk about all things geopolitical, financial, and all the matters of the world that are paramount in importance right now. So if you are new to the podcast, please do like, subscribe, and share so this message gets out to those who have not yet been afforded the knowledge that you are getting. And as you can see today, he's come from, as a favor to me, he's come from behind the camera incognito, as promised, to join us. So SG, welcome as always, brother. How are you doing today? Doing well, John. Thanks for having me back. Oh, believe me, it's an honor. You're you're one of our most wanted guests and, and for good reason. So I'm going to hit you right off the top of the bat here, SG, with some questions we prepared for you, as always. And the first one being SG, kind of doing a backwards forwards discussion. On our last podcast, I believe it was in September, if I remember correctly, you had mentioned with respect to the global reset that you wouldn't be surprised to see everything transact within 60 days, which would indicate some time from then to now being November. The information circulating seems to suggest that there's a high degree of probability for this to occur. So with the knowledge and access of information that you have, would it be fair to say in your estimation that that being November might be the most likely result for the Iraqi dinar and the Vietnamese dong, as well as other currencies to ensue in terms of revaluation? I think that's a really reasonable you know, proposition, John. We're talking about hypotheticals and speculatives primarily, but when we look at the behavior of BRICS, the behavior of Iran, the current summit happening now between Russia, the BRICS nations, and then China increasing their rhetoric just in the last three weeks, that they're increasingly willing to support military intervention and preservation of their allies and their interests in the Middle East, at the same time that Russia is forging a pretty significant partnership with Tehran. I think what you've got all in, in all of this is the landscape being built out for BRICS to permanently dethrone the dollar. We know that the BRICS pay system has now been released. We can see the image from that. We can see the logo. It's clearly a platform that they're creating. Russia just yesterday stated uh, that um, BRICS needs its own platform, its own payment platform worldwide in order to function as a cohesive and congealed trading block. That would clearly sidestep all of Western markets. At the same time, John, you have Russia and China. They're no slouch at the table. China has the largest industrial base, or excuse me, one of the largest industrial bases in the world. Russia is the most well-equipped with commodities, especially resources like natural gas, oil, and rare earth minerals. Um, you've got both of those countries heavily involved in efforts in Africa, where you have rubber, oil, uh, you know, lithium, more rare earth minerals, mines, things of that nature. So this is not really... Um, I think an implausible scenario. I think what's what's very likely to come here over the next 60 days, of course, now we're into the 30 day window, you know, around T minus 35 or so towards the end of November. I think we're really going to see, you know, fleshed out BRICS behavior. I think we're going to see military activity on behalf of BRICS. And I really think it's possible that we see the conflict between Israel and Iran go postal before that period's over. You read my mind once again, brother, because that's what we think as well. We think that once President Trump is re-elected or how we look at it, elected and appointed to his rightful place that that's what israel primarily could be waiting for to do their strike which you know the power plants and the uh the nuclear facilities and such uh would trigger uh per kim clement the dinar and then I'll, I'll get to some other points in a minute that support what you're saying <clears throat> but speaking of the reset and BRICS, uh as you mentioned we have the BRICS conference wrapping up today as we're talking and all the information, as you said, pointing out to a BRICS unit currency backed in gold. And notice that it actually had, had several zeros included, and there was sort of a labyrinth pattern on the back. So it was very specific codes and details uh, contained within the currency itself. Um, so I guess the follow-up question to what you kind of led into is, do you suspect that they're going to make an announcement that they're de-dollarizing and fully nationalizing the currencies that are involved within BRICS? Or do you, do you think that they're just simply going to do it and not even bother making an announcement? I think that's going to be state by state. I think you're going to see some announcement from some states that really want to stick it to the West and stick it to the U.S. dollar. And that's going to be how they're going to sort of brag about doing that. And it would not surprise me if we see Iraq make that style of announcement, maybe by the end of January, 1st of February upcoming. Um, I think Iran is likely to make that very similar kind of announcement. I would not be surprised if Russia was to make that announcement a second time. Putin has already said that at the 
uh, summit that they went to in South Africa, I believe it was a year or two ago, essentially telling the world that the plan is absolutely to de-dollarize the planet and to strengthen the alternate markets worldwide, as well as to build out alternative alternative trade routes that are not affected by you know certain jurisdictional restrictions from countries that are sort of in bed with Washington, D.C., I think at the end of the day, what's going to happen is you're going to see a progression of events begin before any announcement. And then the announcements will simply confirm the progression of events that are already in motion. That's exactly what we've seen out of Beijing, out of Moscow, out of Tehran, all of the major BRICS players, including Saudi Arabia and South Africa, just in the last 18 months. And I think that that pattern is likely to continue. I think you're probably on to something there as usual, SG. And to that point, let's juxtapose another point that kind of dovetails what you're saying nicely. Um, I'm sure you've seen the news today on your respective telegram, but uh, the President Putin today said, APRIC said he welcomes a discussion with President Trump that will lead to the war ending in Ukraine. We know this is the narrative for peace in each respective country. So would you might opine that the next peace deal after Ukraine might be the aforementioned China-Taiwan that's brewing along with Israel? so that um, in a sense that would free up Vietnam enough out of communism to help the dong currency revalue. I've not heard it put that way before, but that would not surprise me. We know that Russia has a very vested interest in what's going on with Vietnam. China does as well for obvious reasons, but you know, Russia is continuing and increasing involvement and, and, and with, especially with respect to the complexity of their involvement in Indonesia, North Korea, Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos, South Asia, it's very interesting and it's very you know, telling to see so much involvement from Moscow on that particular issue. If we were to see uh, a situation like that play out, which would allow for the dong to revalue, that would absolutely desecrate the arms trade coming in and out of the South Korean peninsula. The South Korean arms embargo, oh, excuse me, the arms dealing that happens there, uh, I was going to say embargo, but that's not what's actually occurring. The arms dealing that's actually happening in that area of the world is funded primarily through the U.S. dollar and the ability of black market forex dealers on the ground to alternate currencies in you know literally denominational format in a few hours or in a couple of days, depending on how much currency the buyer, uh, given any buyer around the world, is trying to convert and maneuver. When you're trying to shield paying for things like human trafficking, smuggling, weapons dealing, etc., one of the ways that you do that is to create that exact landscape. Russia went on the war path against that landscape in Africa about six months ago, no, excuse me, about nine months ago now, and has only accelerated that process, especially pertaining to uranium mines in Central Africa. So looking at what's happening in uh, that East Asian sector, I could absolutely see that as a plausible situation. And I could also see that happening again in the next four to six months. We're talking about an election cycle here that's coming to a conclusion. We'll have a, essentially a 60-day period of uh, uncertainty and probably a great deal of shifting back and forth inside the United States of America prior to the inauguration uh, coming up in January of 2025. And I think all bets are off in that 60 day period. You can move the needle rapidly down the road geopolitically around the rest of the world in a very short amount of time when you're in between U.S. presidential administrations. Agreed. And going back a second to your point about um, a lot of these countries sort of, you know, threatening and making good on the de dollarization or removal of the dollar as a hegemony. Uh, you have Iraq, who's already stated clearly with Price, uh, Prime Minister Sudani this year that they are going to be done with the dollar completely by or before the end of the year. I won't think that they were going to wait till Christmas to do that. I think it would, you know, probably abut the holidays of anything just for the sentiment, because now Iraqis, some of them anyway, are, are celebrating Christmas like we do. So that's kind of an interesting footnote. I think another point, SG, that we need to dovetail into this discussion or integrate is the aspect of XRP, because we know that back on August 12th, um, as you are aware as a historian yourself, that uh, India did a rather large oil purchase with China using the Petro Yuan, and they used the XRP ripple to facilitate that. So clearly XRP is well integrated into these countries as part of the BRICS. An article came out recently today that I was not aware of, maybe you are, seems to suggest that Brad Garling House of Ripple has donated a sizable amount to the Harris campaign. Are you aware of this? And if so, what do you make of that? Well, I'm not aware of it. I'm aware of it now, now that I've I've been told that by you on, on the show today. And that's very interesting. That's an interesting maneuver. I'd have to sit back and really reflect on what that could mean. 
Mm-hmm. You know, Putin endorsed Harris also. We know that there's absolutely no reasonable situation where Vladimir Putin actually wants the U.S. deep state behind Kamala Harris in control of the presidency. So that's clearly a chess move. And a few days later, President Trump confirmed as much at one of his rallies when he described Putin as a chess player, referencing that exact endorsement. You know, Ripple is involved in some regards or has been involved, excuse me, in some regards with the World Economic Forum. But we're told online that a number of different you know, players and heavy hitters in certain industries have signed certain deals, have agreed to come on board on Patriot Enterprises. I don't want to pass judgment inappropriately on anyone at Ripple XRP uh, and, and opine out of my wheelhouse on what XRP actually means. I will say that I find it absolutely fascinating that we now have a cross-border facilitation occurring with XRP inside the BRICS nations. And those nations, once again, nations that do not benefit from Kamala Harris uh, or anyone inside the U.S. deep state from being the president, it's very interesting that BRICS is, is, is using XRP to help facilitate those transactions at the same time that you're hearing about donations from XRP to that American deep state. That's why I asked you because it seemed a bit contrapuntal and the, I, I think we think as a team, it's, it definitely you know, smacks of moves and counter moves. We just haven't yet figured out you know, what the decode is, but with enough time, we think that we, we all will get to that point. So I'd be curious on our next podcast to kind of, as you had a chance to chew on it and marinate, you know, what comes to mind for you with regards to that. So thank you for that. Um, <clears throat> last week we had, um, this is very interesting. This just came out today. Last week, President Trump, as you know, announced that he was considering removing all income taxes from one third of Americans. <laughs> well, today in an article of all places, the New York Times, talk about moves and counter moves, came out and said that he is hinting at removing income taxes from all Americans altogether. Uh, so do you think this is a case, SG, of sort of the proverbial frog in the pot and you just turn up the heat slowly until it acclimates, kind of doing the same thing with the American public, getting them sort of acclimated to the idea of the removal of income tax and then you know property tax since both are unconstitutional? Well, I absolutely do believe that that's what's going on. I think that you're living through the narrative seeding for exactly that. If you follow, you know, boots on the ground citizen journalists over the last two years coming out of Washington, D.C., one fact is virtually inarguable, and that's the fact that the Federal Reserve and the IRS buildings are both boarded up. They have plywood inside all of their windows. They're, the access into the ground floor is restricted by fencing and has been for a number of years. So the removal or maybe the reabsorption of the Federal Reserve into the U.S. Treasury is a huge part of this process. And you're talking about reconciling a 100 plus year old fraud going back to 2017 when President Trump first took office. So I think fundamentally what we've got going on here is the seed being prepared for Americans to understand that with the removal of the Federal Reserve foreign locus of control and the return of the constitutional and domestic locus of control over the Treasury to the United States, one of the things that is removed in so doing are the unconscionable and unconstitutional tax acts that are associated with that Federal Reserve. In 1895, for example, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled that income tax was unconstitutional. So to circumvent that particular ruling during the le- in the legislative intent of the 16th Amendment, President William Taft conferred the federal income tax upon the territory only of the national government and those contracted with or employed by the national government, which at the time was only the 10 by 10 area of Washington, D.C. The national government is seated in D.C., but the state territories are themselves the republic and their sovereign entities, not subject directly to the control of the national government. Rather, the national government is sort of a symbiotic union that is created by the states being all together with one another. So with respect to the income tax in particular, we all know the history behind that. We know we were told it was temporary, and of course it was not because no government program ever is. But we do have to reconcile and and find a way to recompense that arrangement. And I think you're seeing the prep for that now. Absolutely. And as you know, SG, speaking of history, uh, markers or demarcations, as you know, the income tax initially after the 1913 period with the Federal Reserve, which is neither federal or has any reserves, um, <laughs> ironic statement there, uh, that uh, initially the way they rolled it out was through you know Puerto Rico with ATF, alcohol, tobacco, and firearms as a luxury tax. And it worked so well that they started putting on people. But as you know, constitutionally, it, there's no requirement that individuals have to pay taxes, just corporations. And we are not a corporation, even though they consider us that, we are not. So <clears throat> it's really interesting to see sort of the un- Wonderfully interesting to see the unwinding of the past and that, you know, President Trump, along with the military and many other patriots have worked tirelessly 
to, um, as you said, in one of our last podcasts, almost be like in a locomotive that takes a while to stop, but then when it goes in the other direction, it just picks up with so much momentum that it becomes unstoppable as it was prior to the going the direction. Um, <clears throat> let me ask you a geopolitical question. I want you to feel left out that it's so slanted to finances. Um, we have heard discussions that Clarence Thomas has already decided as of June this year with respect to the Supreme Court to overturn the 2020 election vis-a-vis -vis the Brunson case. Now, we had Loy earlier on this month to discuss that, and he seemed a bit reluctant to discuss any details and even seemed to downplay the, cases, uh, the case status being active altogether. I was just curious if you could confirm as best you can whether or not this is true, and if it is, why is President Trump saying November 5th is the day of victory if he's already won? Is that just part of a narrative in the overall plan? You know, this is a really fascinating question, John, because you're getting at some of the politics and the, the irregular warfare goings on that I'm trying to break down that I tried to break down in audio file 83, which I'm releasing pretty soon. Um, with respect to Brunson, what I find very fascinating is that Loy, who I've met personally, and I, I think he's a phenomenal human being, just by the way, he has always been very upfront about it's the court, it's the court, it's the court, it's the law, it's the law, it's the law. And suddenly we have a change in rhetoric over the last six to eight weeks. We also have reports coming out, and I've not heard it directly from Loy himself, but I've heard it from people who have spoken directly with him that I believe to be credible, that there is now an NDA at play with respect to the Brunson case. There's only one reason that you have an NDA, and I'm going to leave that for your very intelligent audience to sort of conclude on their own. So looking at this landscape, if we were to see the turning over of the 2020 election by the Supreme Court going into the 2024 election, we would have the predicate created for you know, civilizational level deployment of whatever the Democrats have left. That sort of ties back to that 60-day period of uncertainty I was talking about a moment ago. Suppose for a moment in a hypothetical that we come into this election season, there's a lot of nefarious malfeasance and uh, crazy behavior at play at the polling centers and, and in the days and maybe a couple of weeks after. But President Trump is eventually declared the winner because it's just an inarguable and undeniable landslide. If that's the case, then you would have, I think, the situation set up to allow for uh, retroactive enforcement of that Brunson decision all throughout the past four years to undo a great deal of what's happened. And if that were allowed to be, you would essentially ensnare the entirety of the U.S. bureaucratic deep state in the process, because now they've all been caught out violating multiple national emergencies over a near 10-year period of time. What I think is very possible is that we see Brunson come into play in the next four to six weeks pertaining to this election, and then we see some sort of attempted destabilization by the other side to prevent the election from going to certification in January. Okay, great. Thank you, as always. So let's take SG inside of that without giving away too much of your audio file for 83. Um, let's take a couple of sub questions inside of that question, because I think it's there's more there's more components and parts to it, to your point. Let's just let's just imagine for a moment that it does come out that uh, the Supreme Court says, yeah, you know, because tr Trump's always said, you know, 2025, 2020 has to be dealt with. We can't just, you know, have an election until we deal with that. Let's say that it is overturned and he's returned back. How would that work in terms of him getting back the four years that we, you know, during 2020 to 24, even though he's the commander in chief, getting that back from a presidential standpoint? And then how would that play in terms of Nassara? Because our understanding is once he's optically back, he's going to announce Masara in some form or fashion. Well, you know, that's a that's a really difficult question. Looking at the landscape of how this could play out, John, you know, fundamentally as it pertains to the the actual election itself and tying back into the financial government, I think those two pathways, for lack of a better term, are sort of running parallel but are exclusive. You know, the financial component strikes me as much more geopolitical. It was certainly caused and initiated by the first Trump administration. We've seen the Office of Military Settlement documents. We've seen the reconciliation of the U.S. bankruptcy. We've seen the separation from Companies House in London. We know that that's absolutely the case. Uh, but the realization of that out into the public for, I think, in many ways has to be apolitical because we're talking about commerce. We're talking about value exchange. Really, we're talking about economic government uh, and, and, and economic government structure. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, I spaced on the first part of your question. If you could remind me about that sub-question part, the first part of that, I'd be grateful. No, that's fine. I think really was just driving at how, how does he, 
Okay, all of this ultimately, SG, is under what we consider to be the housing of Nasara, the financial part, but also, you know, removal of banker wars, or, you know, you know, bringing people back to their home countries where they can prosper and have nationalism and have peace and all that. It's all sort of entwined in that. But the the, gen the genesis of that sub question was, how do you rectify the four years getting that back? How do you give that back to him if you're overturning the 2020 election? Granted, he's been the commander in chief the whole time. But from an optic standpoint, how do you give him back those four years that was taken from him? I think the I think the return of those four years, John, probably lies in the definition of fraud itself and U.S. v. Throckmorton. You know, fraud vitiates everything. And when we talk about vitiate, it's worth noting for the audience out there that vitiate means to eradicate as though it never existed. So we would simply return to November the 2nd of 2020 if we were to see something like that, you know, happen from the Supreme Court. All Any acts of Congress passed in that period of time would be nullified. Certainly executive orders by the Manchurian administration would all be nullified. Um, how that would cascade throughout our system is incredibly difficult to speculate and hypothesize on because it's literally never happened before. Um, I'm looking at this from a from a landscape of, you know, we have to write the political situation. Certainly, we have to clean the books. We have to secure our elections. We have to ensure that there's integrity between the states and that there's continuity in federal agencies and things of that nature. And at the same time, we also have to completely redefine and reimagine the financial structure of the United States of America right back to the trusts of the original republic. So. I, the only way I could think that we can reconcile those two is to have them running parallel and then to allow the legal landscape to restore the civilian government, certainly with you know the cooperation of the military, which Trump, again, just a few days ago, told Maria Bartiromo that it could be handled at the election centers, could be handled by the National Guard, or if really necessary, and I'm quoting directly here, if really necessary, by the military itself. So looking at that and seeing a potential transition of power back to the original Republic Treasury, it makes a lot of sense that the high court would run parallel in their determinations. And again, you would have that legal system unfolding where uh, a proper government is returned and a and essentially what amounts to an imposter government and impersonation government is essentially initiated as though it would no longer as though it was never a thing. So in essence, if I'm hearing you right, appreciate the articulation as usual. Um, if I'm hearing you correctly, it's kind of a wholesale reset, right? In terms of not just economically, but constitutionally, geopolitically, and almost you could say in a sense of sovereignty, right? Because we would be getting our sovereignty back in a variety of different forms. And to your point, you know, he's, I've heard him say, you know, publicly, hey, you know, I'd love the military to handle this and, and get involved. He's kind of almost like he's baiting them, but he's really sending a calm to us. So that seems to kind of support, substantiate what you were just mentioning. Um, turning to another point, kind of backwards a little bit, what we were discussing before, we see the IMF imploding, having a lot of internal conflicts, especially in relation to Christian Lagarde, who, as you know, is the former IMF chief and now the head of the ECB, European Central Bank, which to me is a lot like going from the frying pan to the fire. You're really just replacing one headache for another. Um, do you surmise that the IMF has sort of lost its proverbial grip on the world's economic front? And if so, was that always by design by Trump's uh, team and plan? Um, yes and yes is the short answer to that question. The IMF is one of the entities that we've uncovered as having been sworn, as having had oaths sworn to it by U.S. political representatives at the state and local level. So the IMF was always one of the targets of this worldwide financial reset. The World Bank is another entity that was always one of the targets. Certainly the Bank of International Settlements is one of the targets. And anything associated with the fluidity, the liquidity, and the day-to-day -day operations of any of those entities would also have been included in those targets. So think Edmund Rothschild Group, the Monaco Rothschild Group, uh, any branch of the, of the uh, HSBC Group, for example, and others. Um, Looking at that particular you know, institution, what I find very, very fascinating is the fact that the U.S. Congress took measures about a year and a half ago and expecting the IMF to essentially implode. Uh, they put in, uh, I believe it was a fast tracking of Taiwan into the IMF because they're expecting the IMF is no longer going to be viable for their semiconductor and transhumanistic AI agenda beyond this presidential election. Uh, that's one of the reasons I think you've seen China sort of you know, ebbing and flowing with this, uh, you know, imminent invasion of Taiwan, we say imminent, it's been imminent now for over two years when we got when we first got the initial uh, public go ahead from President Trump at a Pennsylvania rally in 2022 for Beijing to do exactly that. 
So the realization of that out into the public four, I think that ties back to some of this as well. When China chooses to do that, it's going to destroy the IMF and it's going to really harm, I think, the World Bank in many regards, the same World Bank that is currently helping uh, to reset the Iraqi dinar. So it's sort of like where we, we have to you know, break our own thumb to get out of the handcuffs, so to speak. And I think that's exactly what we've been doing around the world in bits and pieces now for the last few years. Military activity in the Pacific, I have to say, John, I'm really surprised that we've not seen it up until this point. I mm. fully expected it to come immediately on the heels of the Olympics this past year, as well as I expected the Olympics to be utilized narrative wise for a super spreader event. And it seems that neither one of those has occurred, which is fantastic news, gives me a mm. little bit of egg on my face, but it's fantastic news fundamentally for the people of the Western world. However, while the biological super spreader you know, speculation may be a little bit more hypothetical and a little bit more nebulous, difficult to iron out, uh, one thing that is not nebulous at all is the fact that Taiwan will be returned to China before this process is over. How quickly that happens, I think, is anybody's guess. But when that occurs, you're going to see a turn down in Western financial markets that has never occurred before. 100%. And that's one of the things we talk about, SG, you may or may not be privy to, depending on how much, you don't have a lot of time, obviously, with how busy your schedule is. But on other podcasts, we deal with subject matter experts. That's one thing uh, that we often frequently ask them across the board is, you know, in 2025, with China, Taiwan precipitating, we've talked about the dong and the impacts and implications for that in a good way. Then you have a counter move for the US as a, as a country. Because as you know, I would say it's a fairly conservative uh, statement to make that 99% of the population has no idea that this reset is occurring. It's this movement that we're ensconced, thankfully, uh, and God's people to make sure that they, you know, are using it appropriately to do kingdom work and help others who are not part of said reset, uh, which is that uh, we have an issue brewing next year that we need to be praying about, which is the, a 10% decrease in the bond market. Just 10% would be catastrophic to the U.S., but we could be facing a situation in the next five plus years, right? That it's 50% or more. And that's has all types of implications to your point. So there's there's a greater measure of landscape that we need to consider. So I'm really appreciative you brought that up. Um, finally, one of the last things I want to talk to you about today, SG, we've covered, as we typically do, a good gamut of versatile subjects that are timely and important, I, I believe, is we have silver and gold, as you need to see, moving up precipitously, while all the other aforementioned items are playing themselves out for the world to see. Do you see gold and silver continuing to rise while the dollar index continues to fall? And if so, does that put inherent pressure on the U.S. to return to constitutionally sound gold and silver money through a U.S. back note and you know, auditing the Fed and, and returning the gold standard? You know, John, I'm going to answer that question by first quoting an entity online that my entire platform is based off of. And the drop reads, gold shall destroy the Fed not turn it down, not inhibit it, not, um, you know, cause a hiccup in the system. We're going to destroy the Fed with precious metals using an asset-backed system. That's the obvious inference, you know, the takeaway from that statement. We have then watched since that particular drop was posted, I believe it was 2018, it might have been 2019, we have watched in that period of time gold go from around $1,700 per ounce to more than $2,600. I think that particular style of rise, you're talking around $100 per ounce per year, um, that's meteoric. That's about as fast as you can rise, I think, in an overarching commodities market worldwide and not implode various regional markets, which would cause a cascade effect, of course, into the international space. Mm -hmm. You know, Zimbabwe is, is increasingly using more of their gold bag zig currency for economic transactions inside the nation, and they are continuing and have been now for over 12 weeks a very aggressive law enforcement operation to completely eradicate black market currency manipulation inside their nation. They're extremely resource rich. They're just one nation that's doing that. There's four or five of them just in Africa that are modeling that same attitude towards precious metals and the various ores and, and uh, rare earth metals that they have you know, in their nations. So the question fundamentally that you asked was, do I see precious metals as increasing in their value into the future, perhaps becoming staples uh, underpinning you know, economies worldwide? And the obvious answer, I think, is yes, it has to be. But I think it's going to be more than that. We've seen precious metal systems for the last 2,000 years, and they work incredibly well, but they're not completely foolproof. There's different uh, amounts of gold, for example, inside Zimbabwe's land than underneath Brazil or underneath Canada, for example. Uh, the same is true of all of the other resources, metals, commodities, and, and you know, underpinnings of those hardcore tangible asset markets. 
So I think it's very likely that what we see is a new economic model, a completely original economic model that has never existed on planet Earth before, spearheaded by the precious metals space, but primarily composed of assets and tangibles just writ large. That would allow for proper valuation across the entirety of the international landscape. Russia, which is very rich in gas and steel, for example, could trade mm -hmm. very fairly with Zimbabwe or Saudi Arabia if we had a tangible assets system rather than just a gold system or a silver system or a platinum system, etc. And I think also one of the other benefits that comes from an overall tangibles economy rather than just a precious metal system is that you can very easily tokenize tangibles. That allows for the quantum system, the quantum capability of digital computing and blockchain technology to be implemented not just as a gold equivalent, but as an entirety of resource equivalent worldwide. And fundamentally, John, if we were to do that, we would make it impossible to commit the same type of fraud again that has been committed on the world the last 300 years. This goes back to your original point, SG, of fraud vitiating everything, which is also goes back to being, in essence, a reset, right? And I'm really glad that you said what you said about all of it, uh, because a lot of these co countries copy each other. You know, we, co we copy Iraq, vice versa, and you can see Iraq is, uh, or Zimbabwe is taking its cues from Iraq with, you know, de-dollarizing. As you're aware, China, uh, I think this summer offered uh, Zimbabwe $300 million to go and mine metals because they know what they have. And they said, no, they want to mine their own because they, in fact, have the most gold in the world above and below ground, bar none, undisputed. And so what we're watching for, to your point, is what we're really seeing is the same thing that we're seeing for precious metals, removal of the corruption. Now that the banks are Basel III compliant as of October 1st, they can no longer hide papering down gold and silver, which means you're going to have to see transparency coupled with the QFS to your cogent point, you'll get Zimbabwe, they get a regime change from the corrupt Mangawa to Nelson Chamisa, who is a Christian, a man of the people. We know he's working with Trump. We know he's working with Musk, with Starlink. He's wearing gold ties. He said 20 promises upon his return. Who else had that? President Trump. Parallels. So that is a country that is going to thrive with their Zim bonds tucked into said Zig dollars and coins, which are all gold back under basically one centralized currency unit, which sounds a lot like, as you put, said or alluded to, BRICS is doing. So it's like they're kitty cornering off each other. But I think it's really exciting that we're going to, you know, I'm watching to see if we, if Trump appoints Judy Shelton, because, you know, his first term, he kind of, you know, kind of flew that in as a litmus test to see how in a corrupt um, Congress and Senate, it might play now with a completely drained swamp and a level playing field, both geopolitically and financially. Uh, it, it should be a very nice, smooth and seamless transition. So I'm very pleased to see that you're in the same alignment. Well, I'd like to throw something else Please. in on that, John, if I could. It's sort of a, an homage out there for all the awake patriots and Anons that have been talking about these issues since the first Trump administration. You know, I came on air in 2022, but I realized under President Trump that this was a businessman who, if he understood the world economy, he would attempt to revalue in some form or fashion world markets. And that's exactly what we've seen. So I'd like to highlight for everyone out there, the Patriots and Anons that have been tracking this for six, seven, even eight years and beyond at this point, there's two major talking points that people have been talking about in that space. One of those talking points is the revaluation and reset of worldwide financial markets, which we're seeing currently and have been seeing now sort of publicly on display for 18 months. The other major talking point is military intervention to stop World War III and restore we the people to power. So far, Anons and Patriots have a pretty good track record. Well said and, and couldn't agree more. And uh, it's patriots like you in conjunction with others that have helped make the difference. And so we thank you for your copious contributions as always. As you know, SG, as we end our podcast today, we always give our guests the last word and where they can find your work. So I will turn that over to you thusly. Indeed, I appreciate that. I can be found on four places now. I'm on rumble.com slash user slash Q News Patriot. I'm on X at the handle the T H E Q News Patriot. I'm on Truth Social at the handle Real R E A L S G and on. And I'm now officially on Telegram, John, in an attempt to counter some of the colossal levels of fraud on Telegram under my copycat name. So mm -hmm. the official SG and on Telegram channel that is authentically me is t.me slash real R E A L Q News Patriot. And with respect to the last word, my friend, I'm extremely excited for what we have coming ahead of us. We've got a landscape literally being built out right now to allow for the transition of the Western world, the NATO world, from the old financial system of slavery to a new financial system of 
freedom and I think proper valuation. And if we think that the opponents that remain in that particular fight are going to go down without a struggle, we are wrong. But if we think that they're going to somehow prevent us from accomplishing that goal, we are also wrong. This is an incredible period of time. Russia is not going to allow this to continue into the future. Neither is China, neither is the American population base. And with those three, uh, you know, large geopolitical players worldwide sort of at the table of the same mindset, the rest of the planet really has no choice but to come along. Yeah, and, and to your point, SG, if I may just add a counterthought, um, as you know, being a history buff, Russia really saved our bacon during World War II, and they're doing it all over again, financially and geopolitically. So, you know, future proves past history repeating itself once again. And, uh, yeah, it's, it's kind of exciting to see everything kind of come full circle to your point. And we will definitely put all of your links uh, in said description for people to find you. Speaking of descriptions, as you know, folks, um, we're, you just heard SG say it, we're in the season of the reset. It's coming, we're coming in for a landing. Uh, it may not be a soft landing financially for those who are unprepared. For those of you who are, uh, it's going to be a very good one because you're going to be the position of the light and the proverbial darkness over this transitory period like he was alluding to earlier. So if you are looking to get uh, Dinar, Dong, Zim, Boulevard, Zim bonds, uh, agro checks, any of the aforementioned currencies and bonds, or you want to add to your position, we'll leave that link in the description. Also, for respect to precious metals, we have a great relationship with a uh, gold and silver, platinum, palladium, copper dealer, including 401k and IRA conversions. Uh, and if you are looking for that, in addition to the limited edition coin that we've now come out with for our channel, we've only made 100 of them. And uh, they are a rare coin. They are 9999 pure silver, one ounce. And uh, we, those are available for purchase. Or if you would like to gift one to someone, like we're going to be, uh, as you were doing a raffle, we're giving away at five to 10% of the coins to the people in the greatest need, elderly or people in uh, disability or financially disadvantaged positions, which is the thing, of course, especially in this economy and this climate. Uh, we're going to be putting our money where our mouth is and giving away a certain amount of raffles. So if you buy one, uh, you'll be able to participate in the raffle to get one, or you can simply buy one and donate it as a humanitarian fund to someone in need. We will also leave that said link in the description. SG Anon, thanks for joining us, good sir. We always appreciate it. It's nice to see your face and uh, we look forward to seeing you again next month to see how this all turns out. Likewise, John. God bless. Stay safe. We'll speak soon. God bless, brother.